So we begin in James chapter one, and we'll uh, start with just a uh, brief um, introduction here to establish the, uh, the audience that James is talking about and who James is. And most commentators would agree that the James that wrote this epistle is uh, James, the Lord's brother. And we're not going to look up all the passages there, but, um, you know, James, it, it says there in Mark chapter six, he says, is not this the carpenter, the brother of James? So we know that the master had a brother named James, and most commentators would agree that this is the James that wrote the epistle of James. I think epistle that James was at first not a believer. He was unbelieving. And that was predicted or prophesied in Psalm 69. In Psalm 69, verses 7 and 8, it says, I'm a stranger unto my brother's children. And was one of the ones who was an unbeliever, the brethren of the master who in Mark chapter 3, instead of sitting about him, listening to him, was with his mother and his brother and standing without. But through the course of the ministry of the master and through his life and his death, it seems that James was finally convinced by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, After that he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. So the master actually appeared to James first before he appeared to the rest of the apostles. And that seems to be a bit of a turning point in the life of James. But as his spirituality progressed, he became a pillar in the ecclesia. Galatians chapter 2 says that James, it actually says there James seemed to be a pillar. The Greek says he was acknowledged to be a pillar. So he was looked up to. He, he performed a leadership in a leadership capacity in the ecclesia at that time. His authority was recognized um, at the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15. And this next slide talks about uh, James' role in the Jerusalem conference and actually um, provides us with a bit of a description, a physical description of James was. And it says there, and I quote, this is from Coney Barenhausen, it says, the opinion of another speaker still remained to be given. This was James, the brother of the Lord, who from the austere sanctity of his character was commonly called James the Just. No judgment could have such weight in the Judaizing party as his. In garb and appearance, he resembled John the Baptist with austere features, the linen ephod, the bare feet, the long locks and unshorn head of the Nazarite. Such, according to tradition, was the man who came forward and solemnly pronounced that Mosaic rites were not of eternal obligation, contending that the Jewish dispensation was, in truth, the preparation for the Christian. So there we get perhaps a little bit of an indication uh, and a description of who this man James was, a physical description. It seems that James was very simple in appearance but yet he was knowledgeable. He was spiritual by word and by deed, by example. And he's compared there in that description to somebody like John the Baptist. So we get this mental picture of who James was and uh, the position that he held within the community. So when we look at the epistle of James, I think it's important, especially in our considerations uh, this weekend, to understand where James is pulling his information from. Where is the background? Usually with the epistles, there's some background information in an Old Testament pa passage that they're pulling from. And so if you look at the bottom of that side, the Proverbs and the teachings of the Master, in particular the Sermon on the Mount, have been very well documented. In fact, the, um, the epistle of James has been styled as the Proverbs of the New Testament, if you will. But what is not so well documented, and I think provides an excellent backdrop to the book of James, is his connections with Leviticus chapter 19 and the book of Job. Neither of those connections are well documented in any of the commentaries, and yet 
the connections seem to be incredible when you look at them. Job is one of the strongest of all the connections in James. And I would suggest to you that James is pulling extensively from the example of Job and from the book of Job. So let's look at that in, in some more detail here. In the next couple slides, I have listed the uh, James use of Leviticus chapter 19. And we're not going to go through all of those things. I just have them listed there so that you can see the number of connections between Leviticus chapter 19 and the epistle of James. And there's another slide there that articulates more of them. And so he pulls from uh, Leviticus chapter 19, which, in, and we're not going to turn up to back to Leviticus 19. We will, through the course of the weekend, refer back to some of the passages from Leviticus 19. But Leviticus 19 deals with various sundry laws and ordinances, principles of conduct as to how they were con the children of Israel were to conduct themselves within their congregations. And so what James does here, and he's addressing his Jewish brethren in the dispersion, he's providing for them a bridge from the principles of the law and conduct under the law as articulated in Leviticus 19 as to how to reapply those principles in ecclesial life. And James writes his epistle with that viewpoint in mind, taking the principles of uh, conduct under the law and applying them in the ecclesia. And so he makes extensive use of Leviticus chapter 19. And even to a greater extent, he takes the example of Job. And I don't want you to read this slide. If you want these slides, I have actually, uh, there's three slides here on James and Job showing the comparisons. Actually, four, three and a half, I guess. But I have those in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet if anybody is interested in them. But I put those slides, they're just screenshots of my Excel spreadsheet, just to show you the number of connections between Job and James. James is the only New Testament uh, writer to allude to Job. He's the only one that mentions Job and the only one that mentions him by name. And we know that Job is an example, isn't he, of steadfast endurance under persecution, steadfast endurance under persecution. And I think James alludes to Job because Job gives us a, a unique look at how trial, tribulation, and persecution work in a believer's life. Two things we learn from the example of Job. The first thing is any amount of righteousness that we display in this life does not preclude us in any way from trial and tribulation. Job was a righteous man. Job was a righteous man. And yet he had to undergo incredible trial, in, incredible tribulation and tragedy in his life. So that's the first thing. Any amount of righteousness we display does not preclude us from trial and tribulation in life. We learn that from Job. The second thing that we see in the life of Job is we see, or we have the luxury of seeing how trial and tribulation in life work to an ultimate good. We can see in Job, we view his life from the beginning to the end. And so as we go through trial and tribulation in life, we don't necessarily have that luxury, but we have that luxury in the life of Job. And so we can see that Job Although he, at the beginning of his life, suffered incredibly, it all ended up being in, in a, a, he ended up being in a state of ultimate acceptance with his father in heaven. And so we can see how that plays out in his life. And as we go through life, we can't see that. Obviously, we're living in it. We're going through it at the time. We have to go by faith that our life will be just like the life of Job. We have to have the faith that God is working with us to bring us to an ultimate end, just like he was with Job as we go through these trials and tribulations. And so I don't want to spend any more time on um, Leviticus 19 and the connections with Job. We'll see that uh, throughout this weekend as we go through our studies in Job. But I think it's important to look at Job as a backdrop to the book of James, and in particular, 
how to handle trial and tribulation in life. And so who is James writing to? He's writing to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. He's writing to his fellow Jewish brethren who were scattered abroad and anti-Semitism was alive and well. And all of his brethren were suffering in the dispersion wherever they were in Gentile lands at uh, the hands of the authorities and at the hands of the population, those who were persecuting them. And so he, he makes an appeal to his brethren. He's appealing and he says here to my beloved brethren. If we go through this epistle of James about a dozen times, he uses the expression, my beloved brethren. And if you're a Bible marker, you might want to highlight those things because they that will help them to pop out. But it shows here James' concern, his endearment, his association, his inclusion with his fellow brethren, the love that he has for them and the care that he has for them and the concern that he, he uh, has for them and their well-being in the truth. And so he writes this epistle specifically to those who were his brethren who were suffering in the dispersion. And so he begins his epistle. We read that section in chapter one about patience. And patience actually bookends the epistle of James. James chapter one, if you're there in verse three, knowing this, the trying of your faith, it says there worketh patience. And James uses two Greek words primarily for patience. Here in chapter one, he's using that word uh, hupomone. And if you look at the left hand side of that slide, hupomone means cheerful endurance, constancy. It's an abiding under, right? Displaying uh, fortitude. And if you just turn back, keep your finger in James, but go back to Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five articulates for us that, that this type of patience is the fulcrum or the beginning of our spiritual development, if you will. In G Romans chapter 5, it says there in verse 3, it says, not only so, but we also glory in tribulations also, knowing that, and here's where hupomone, here's where patience comes in, knowing that patience, or that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. And so patience is the beginning of that process, right? You can't skip it. You've got to go through these things in life. You've got to develop this hupomone. You've got to develop this patient, cheerful, constant, abiding under trial because that produces experience, which produces hope. And then you're able to share that with others. James takes that and he says at the end, if you go over to James chapter 5 and verse 10, that Job is an example of that type of patience over a long period of time, which is what that word macrothumio uh, indicates. James chapter 5 and verse 7, he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. That's the difference between the one word and the other. One is patience in a single incident or, or through an event, macrothumio is patience in the long term. It's patience over a long extended period of time. Until he received the early and latter rain, verse 8 of chapter 5, be ye also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And then skip down to verse 10, take my brother and the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience, the macrothumio of Job. And this is where Job provides the backdrop to the epistle of James and his exhortation to develop patience. We know that Job had incredible disasters in his life. And so he had to have not just hupomone, but macrothumio type of patience, patience over a long extended period of time. It's a holding out. It's a long protracted restraint of the soul, as Vincent's word study suggests. And so <clears throat> we come back to James chapter one and the development of this hupomone leading to 
macrothumio, if you will, type of patience. It's a lot easier to have patience in a single event than it is to have multiple events that it is to have, sorry, in multiple events that happen one after the other, after the other, like in the life of Job. And so he says in James chapter one, verse two, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Count it all joy. Now, he's not saying there that we're going to start to celebrate and raise our hands and and, you know, wow, great. I, you know, I've got trial and tribulation in my life. I mean, I'm so happy about that. That's, that's not the type of thing that James is talking about, is it? He's not talking about rejoicing in times of tribulation. That would be almost inappropriate to do that in some circumstances. What he's talking about here is having a recognition that God, through these situations in our life, is working with us to bring us to a desired end, just like he was with Job. And so when these things come upon us, we have this, this quiet satisfaction, if you will, or comfort that God is working with us. These things that are happening in our lives are happening for a purpose to bring us to a desired end that God has in mind and that desires to take us to. And so we have this cheerfulness, this calm delight through the various trials or putting to proof in our life. And in James chapter five, the chapter that we were just in, he says, we count them happy, which endure. Maybe perhaps a better expression for count them happy is in Luke chapter one and verse 48, where the same Greek word, is translated, thou shalt call me blessed. Maybe that's a better translation in terms of our common vernacular and understanding. As we go through trials, hopefully people will call us blessed when they see that final outcome. We count them happy. We count them as blessed that endure and maintain the course throughout the trials and tribulations in life. And there's not many of us that are have to go through what Job went through. And we're not going to go and look back at all these passages other than to remind ourselves of the events that happened in the life of Job. His sons and daughters were murdered. Some of them died by a windstorm. His sheep and servants were burned by fire. His camel and his servants were attacked by Chaldeans. And then finally, he himself had boils from head to foot to the point where he wished in himself to die. And there's not many of us that have to endure that level of repeated events and trials and tribulations in life. It's not a matter of whether they will come or not. They will come. Not many of us have to endure what Job endured. But when they do come, the question that we need to ask ourselves as we go through our studies this weekend is how prepared are we to handle life-altering events? How prepared are we to, uh, to handle significant emotional events when they arise in our life? And I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but um, I'm moving my mouse now and hopefully you can follow it. But this is, you know, we will have significant emotional events in life on the left-hand side of this of this continuum. Significant emotional events will happen in our lives. And the idea is that we have to work through those significant emotional events, whatever they are. They could be sickness. They could be, um, you know, the passing away of somebody close to us. They could be financial situations, marital situations, ecclesial situations, you know, whatever uh, uh, situations they are, we will all have events in life that in our common vernacular, we would call significant emotional events. They're life-changing events. And before God, we have to look at those life-changing events. We have to take those, we have to take those significant emotional events and we have to work through them and we have to turn them into something that is a good result that we you know, is the result of a good decision that is a result of good choices that we make in life. And in order to go from one side of that continuum to another, 
We, it, it's a journey. It's not an event. These things, and we like quick solutions in life. We like to have immediate solutions to our problems. And that's not the way these events work in our lives. They take time to work through. And as we work through them, we'll go through stages. And I've outlined three stages on that continuum. We will have an emotional reaction. That's part of who we are. That's part of our makeup. That's part of our nature. And it's important in the healing process as these events take place in our life that we go through that emotional reaction and it plays a role. But we can't get stuck in that first stage. We can't get stuck in that emotional reaction. We need to get past that stage in this continuum. If we don't consciously, proactively move beyond that first stage and we get stuck in it, we will perpetually live in, that, in, in the wake of that emotional reaction. And that will lead to depression. It will lead to anxiety. It will lead to a lot of those stressful disorders that are common in our society. And so we need to get past that. Often we can't get past that alone. We need to invite others in. We need to ask others for help. We need to ask others for assistance. And we need to let others in. And society today says, oh, you know what? I'm going to be stoic. I'm going to handle all these things on my own. I don't need anybody else's help. I can do it on my own. And scripture says that that's not the way we're supposed to handle those situations in life. We need to invent possibilities and we need to make right decisions and take right actions that will lead to an ultimate good result that brings glory to God. And when we're going through, we're in the, we're, when we're in the middle of these significant emotional events, it's hard to see those things. It's hard to invent possibilities. It's hard to take the right, right action. In times of change, often we will just do what we know how to do, whether it works or it doesn't work. The best thing to do, statistically and scripturally, is to ask others for help. We tend to be more self-reliant as individuals and as a society than other reliant. Keep your finger in James chapter 1, but turn, if you will, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it talks about the responsibility that we need to have when we go through and successfully move from one side of this continuum to another. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us, comforteth us in all our tribulation. The word tribulation means pressure. It means affliction, the stresses of life, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Why? that we also might be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And so we have an obligation as we go through one side of this continuum to another, as we go through and work through our emotional events and get to the other side, we not only need to invite people in to help us, but we need to, when we see a fellow brother and sisters going, our fellow brother and sisters going through a similar event, we need to step forward and offer assistance because we've been through it before. We can help them to invent possibilities. We can help them to take the right action before God. And so that's where down at the bottom of the chart, you know, prayer, prayer individually as we're going through the situation and prayer by those who are outside looking in for the people going through the situation Fellowship, working together, providing comfort to one another, and godly wisdom. Those are the three things that James says are necessary if we're going to successfully maneuver through these events in life, through the storms and the upheavals in life. And, you know, you might be sitting there thinking, well, what do you mean by inventing possibilities? What does that mean? How do you turn a significant emotional event into a positive thing by inventing possibilities. I'm going to give you two examples. 
I don't know about down in the yet. States, but up in Canada, we have a program called MAD, M-A-D-D. It's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. That program was started, I think, about 20 or 25 years ago. And it was started by a mother whose son was killed by a drunk driver. And so she decided, in tribute to her son, and to make sure that no other mother, to the best of her ability, had to go through what she went through, she would start this movement called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And now it has gone nationwide. That's an example, a non-ecclesial, non-scriptural example, perhaps. But it gives us an example of what inventing possibilities are. How you invent possibilities to um, take a emo significant emotional event and turn it into a positive give you one inside the ecclesia, you may, um, most of you who are my age would remember Brother Colin Badger. Brother Colin Badger was diagnosed with cancer when he was, I forget exactly how old he was, in his mid-60s. And when he was diagnosed with cancer, he started reading all the Christadelphian literature that had anything to do, like Dennis Gallet's book on healing all thy diseases, and had anything to do with health-related issues. And he found very little that helped him in his situation. And so when I was talking to him, he was telling me what, what he was starting to do was to write a book. He began to write a book, first of all, to help himself. And then his intent was that it would help others as they went through similar circumstances and situations in life. And unfortunately, um, he never completed it. But that's an example of inventing possibilities that look beyond your situation to how you can turn that into a positive to help your fellow brother and sisters in the ecclesia and in the brotherhood. Inventing possibilities during times of trial. And so I'd like to <clears throat> take a couple step backward, a couple steps backwards now and talk about changing the way we think about these events that happen in our lives. And I'd like to look at four, four particular topics here. The first is God is aware and he cares, but topic number two, his ways are not always our ways. Topic number three is the fact that trials and adversities are indeed necessary and scripture brings that out. And we'll look at that when we get there. And in those times, there is a special opportunity for service. So God is aware and he cares. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verses 29 and 30. So it's important as we go through these events in life that we change our thinking to that of what we are instructed by James in his epistle. We need to change our thinking in how we address them. We need to think about them differently as Bible students. Because naturally, as we go through these things in life, you know, we will, our natural tendency is to grumble, it's to complain, it's to wallow in self-pity. And we need to be able to see past our current situation to the opportunity that exists beyond it. And so the first thing that we need to realize is that God is aware and he cares. It's not like he's turned his back on us. He's aware and he cares. Matthew chapter 10 verses 29 to 31, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, for me, that's not, you know, a great feat. I don't have very many of them. But uh, the, the point is here that God knows all the idiosyncrasies and the nitty-gritty details of who we are and what we're dealing with. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? A farthing was a small brass Roman coin. It was the smallest of monetary denominations. In the time of Christ, its value was about a quarter of a cent, not very much at all. And you couldn't buy one sparrow. One sparrow had no value. You had to buy two. You had to buy two sparrows for this uh, farthing. In fact, and we're not going to look it up, but in Luke chapter uh, 5 and verse 12, it says there, 
are not five sparrows sold for two farthings. So if you bought two farthings worth, it's like they threw, threw a sparrow in free. They threw in an extra sparrow. It's like a weekly special. And what does it say about those sparrows who had virtually no value? What does it say about them? Not one of them shall fall on the ground without your father. And so Matthew says, you know, if God is aware of those sparrows, how much more is he aware of you and I? God is very keenly aware of all the circumstances of our life day by day, however small or mean those circumstances might be, to the point where even the very hairs of our head are all numbered. So perhaps if you look at the slide there, this is, this is perhaps the way to look at it. There's, there's really only two types of events in the life of a believer. As God works with us through his angels, there is events that God causes to happen. And there are events that God, through his angels, allows to happen. And through all of those events, we have to take comfort in the words of Psalm 147, that the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. So in all the circumstances of life, we are of more value than many sparrows. And whether we are experiencing adversity or calamity, in life, we have to take comfort that God is there. We have to take comfort that he is aware. And so we are encouraged then to live in a state of constant realization that there is a providential presence, a providential awareness in and of every aspect of our being from day to day. God is aware and he cares. That's point number one. But life doesn't always go the way that we would expect. Deuteronomy chapter 29 says that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. We are going to experience things in life for which we will not have answers. There will be events that transpire in our lives that we can't explain why they happen. What could be the purpose in God in allowing that event or causing that event in my life? There will be things that we will not have an answer for this side of the kingdom. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. His ways are past finding out. We can't know the final end that God has for us. We have to, looking, looking at the life of Job, we have to trust that God is working with us like he worked with Job to deliver us and bring us to a desired end. I'd like to turn up Psalm 77. Psalm 77 is uh, perhaps one of my favorite passages of scripture. Psalm 77 talks about the storms of life. And look at what it says when we experience storms in life. Verse 13 of Psalm 77, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. And sometimes that's what the storms of life feel like, don't they? Thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters. But thy footsteps are not known. It's not that God's footsteps are not there. They're there. We just can't see them. And that's what the psalmist says there, that as we go through those storms, and as, as our ship is tossed to and fro in those storms, we not, may not be able to see the presence of God working with us. We not, may, may not be able to feel the presence of his angels. But we have the confidence that his footsteps are there although they are not known. 
And sometimes we may not see how God was working with us until after the event has passed. Sometimes we may not see or realize how God was working with us at all. And we may not see it until we get to the kingdom. But scripture assures us that his footsteps are there. So trials and adversity are something that we all will experience. Without exception, all of us will experience trials and adversity in life. And they are necessary, and there's a purpose behind them. Look at how God worked with Hezekiah. Turn back, if you will, to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, it says in verse um, 30, where are we? Yeah, verse 31. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. Look at, this is how God works, right? God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. And who is the he? Who is the he in verse 31? Did God need to know all that was in his heart? God already knew what was in his heart. Perhaps he left him to try him so that Hezekiah might learn all that was in his own heart. God already knew. But that's how God works with us. Sometimes these storms come up in life and God leaves us to manage them, quote unquote, on our own. So that we might learn something about who we are, that we might learn something about ourselves, that we might learn about our weaknesses and learn about the tendencies that, that we have, that we need to overcome. Look at what David says in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, David says, it's a good thing that I suffered trial and adversity. Look at what he says in verse 67 of Psalm 119. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word, he says. And if you just go down to verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And so there is good that comes out of some of the affliction. And David recognized that, that there was a purpose behind some of the things that he had to go through in his life. And Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says that in the life of a believer... It says, all things work together for good. That's a pretty tough passage, isn't it? That's a tough passage to read and understand when we're right in the middle of it. All things work together for good. How does that work? Turn, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I think, helps us to put these events in life in perspective. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says that we will experience events of trial and adversity. We will experience tribulation in our life, but we will also experience days of prosperity. So turn if, or look at verse 13 of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It says, consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity, on the one hand, he says... But in the day of adversity, consider, God has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. And so we will have days of prosperity. And he says, in the day of prosperity, he says, be joyful, rejoice in those things. That's a good thing. But conversely, we will also have days of adversity where we're supposed to stop and we're supposed to consider. And those two events in life, your days of prosperity and, and days of adversity, will be different from mine. But in each of our lives, those things are designed by God. It says that at the end of verse 14. God has set the one over against the other in your life to the end that man, you and I, should find nothing after us. And so there will be a balance. We will experience both in life, and there is a purpose behind it, and it's by God's design that we go through those events in life. 
we come back to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, Knowing this, that the trying, the proving, or the putting to test, as that word means, of your faith worketh patience. The word worketh there is toil or wearing effort. It's the accomplishment of something by intense personal effort, as the Greek means. And so what, you know, what James is telling us here in James chapter 1 is we go through these events in our life. He's not telling us, oh, well, you need to count it all joy and it's going to be a piece of cake. That's not what he's telling us. He's telling us in verse 3 that it's going to be difficult. It's going to take work. It's going to be something that wears on you. It's going to take great effort to get through these events in life. He's not trying to belittle that at all. These are difficult things that we deal with day by day. But when we go through them, we're the better people for it, is what God is working with us to accomplish. So that when we are tried, as, as Job says, and in 1 Peter chapter 1 and Zechariah 13, when we are tried, we might come out as gold. So that it will be evident that we are God's people. That's the, that's the goal. And we all know how gold is purified. You know, it's heated up to intense temperatures. And, you know, those are the events that, that take place in our life. And when the gold is heated up, all the impurities rise to the surface. That's when the true disparities in our character come forth, isn't it? Is when we're going through difficult situations. And those impurities rise to the surface. And the way the goldsmith knows the gold is pure is those impurities are taken off. And when he can see a reflection of himself in the gold, he knows that the gold is pure. And so God, as our goldsmith, when he's working with us, when we go through these events in life and we're heated up and those impurities rise to the surface and we work through, the, through those impurities of character, hopefully at the end, like Job, God sees in some small way a reflection of himself as we live our life in Christ. And so let patience work. Let patience have her perfect work. We're not going to look up that passage in Job right now. We're actually going to spend a lot of time uh, looking at wisdom in our exhortation on Sunday and um, patience having her perfect work. But often we don't have patience. Often we don't let patience work. We let our impatience work. And when we let our impatience work, we, we don't create opportunities. We don't uh, create possibilities. We don't get to that final good result. We take whatever solution we can that fits the circumstances at the time that's most convenient, and that's where we stay. So how do we do things differently? Because the goal is that we might be perfect and that we might be entire or complete, wanting nothing. And so when we need to look at these events in life differently, we need to understand that God is aware and he cares. We need to understand, though, that God's ways are not our ways and we won't have all the answers. And we need to realize that these events in life are necessary. But I'd like to leave you with the final thought in our list, and that is that in these times of life, there's a special opportunity for, ser for service. We've already looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that we may be able to comfort them in any time of trouble based on how God has comforted us as we've previously gone through trouble and difficulty in life. But I'd like you to turn to Proverbs chapter 17. We're going to conclude with those two passages on this slide. Proverbs 17 and verse 17. It says there, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. That's maybe not the best translation in the English. If you look at the literal 
translation of verse 17. It should read more correctly, I would suggest, as it reads on the screen. At all times a friend loveth, but in adversity he is born or becomes a brother or sister. At all times a friend loveth, but in adversity, that's when we have the opportunity to become a true brother. That's when we have the opportunity to be a true sister in Christ. That's where we move, move beyond being just a friend, if you will, to being a brother, to being a sister that is walking side by side and sharing in the adversities of life. Isaiah chapter 30, the final passage. Beginning to read there at verse 18, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, Thine eyes shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand and when ye turn to the left. Brethren and sisters, as we go through adversity in life, may we be a true brother. May we be a true sister, and may we share in each other's trials and tribulations so that together as we walk the road to the kingdom, we might hear the word of God whispering in our ear, this is the way, walk ye in it.